Recording in progress. Okay, great. Recording in progress. Okay, great. All right, so we have uh, imported our libraries. We've now defined the size that we want of our of our matrix. Let's go ahead and run that. So we were looking at our screen, our uh, ability to add shortcuts. And so I've created a shortcut. If I press Control 2, it'll actually split those cells independently. So let's look at how I did that. If we go to Tools, Keyboard, Shortcuts, we can now scroll around. And somewhere here, we should see Split at Cursor. And you can see I've assigned it to Control plus 2. You can do anything, anything you'd like. And then, and, and please feel explore these and see what else you can you can combine there, what else you can find. Okay, and the reason why I split that, I think the power of this interpreted language is I can add now empty blocks just by hitting plus. And now I want to see what Z is. I, I'm a visual person. I have to kind of see uh, what these numbers are. I like to kind of get my hands on the numbers and, and actually look at them. This is a lot to look at. So let's make a smaller grid. Let's make it five by five. And then uh, we can kind of see all of our numbers right there. So what we've done is we've asked NumPy to create a five by five matrix of random numbers. None of them are less than zero. None of them are bigger than one. And now we have another value, P, which is 0.5. And what we can do is we can say, where is Z less than P? And so if we run this logical operator, which we lowercase, I mean, uh, less than, this logical operator less than is gonna run in parallel. This is what's really fantastic about this language and is very unique is the ability for it to just guess and says, well, you asked this question and I can answer it for all of these locations. And so it does just that. And so now it'll store that in this matrix M. So we can look at what M is by just the same thing as that. And now we can plot M and we can see it's a picture. It looks like this, right? And so this is as if you were to flip a coin 25 times, and then each time you put the result in the square with the appropriate color. Okay, so now we looked at this, this internal uh, SciPy tool that will measure these blocks. So if we think of this as like a chunk, and this is a chunk, and that's a chunk, so it doesn't count di di diagonal neighbors, only sort of uh, up, down, left, and right counts as a neighbor in this world. And uh, this, this is, we don't have to worry about the details of how this one works for right now, but what this is gonna cool, it's gonna show us because this is kind of a built-in function that's going to measure the size of these little clusters as we change this percolation threshold. As we change this constant that determines how much, what's the probability that we're going to either be uh, a lattice site or empty. So here, if our chance is 0.2, we get these little islands, right? Where, you know, by chance we might get these happen to all go as a cluster, but in general, we don't get a very large cluster. Now we start to get to see larger and larger clusters. I think it looks kind of biological, which is kind of interesting to me as a model for something like proteins or something. It looks sort of like, you know, two dimensional proteins. But what's interesting is we see this sort of phase transition. And as we go, see at 0.5, we already start to get very large clusters. And then as we go to 0.6, now suddenly, boom, we just get basically one cluster, or in this case, two, that it's very unlikely that if you're, a, if you're in there, that you're not going to participate in the cluster, essentially. And then as we increase that, we can see we get sort of full saturation. Okay, so we measured that using this forest fire model. And this is what we're going to look at in detail today. So let's just run through that quickly. We'll come back and what that looks like in another notebook. Get some more screen here. Okay, and then we watched this thing run. And we saw that this was able to simulate a forest fire. It... Uh, fills in and then we get these really awesome waves of excitation waves, this excitable media. So we're gonna look at that in a second. We use this to measure, uh, are these things connected or not? So essentially we simulated this percolation as a simulated fire. We set the middle piece on fire and then we see, does that fire spread all the way through? What the important thing about these kinds of models is, you, you know, you think it's like, well, I'm not interested in forest fires, right? Well, what if this is a simulation of, of, of cancer as it moves throughout the body or ideas as they move throughout the society or animals as they move throughout a new habitat, right? You want to throughout, as we go through all of these examples, you want to kind of, you know, squint or blur your eyes and kind of think, all right, what could I use this for in my own research or in your own studies? Okay, so I set this whole, we set this whole thing up as an experiment where it'll actually test and see whether it hits the, the green wall there on the side. And if it hits the green wall, then we'll just stop and, and call that a percolation. 
And so there it stops the loop and calls that a percolation. And then we can run this whole experiment over it again to see what that looks like. And we can see that for low values, we, we have a, we, we're not going to percolate for very high values. We're always going to percolate. And then if we ran this for lots of trials with this experiment, we saw that we got this to kind of get this cool um, sort of analog curve. So that's going to run there. Let's see. We'll just let that run in the background. So here's many of the trials you can see in different colors there. So if we average them by adding up and then dividing by how many, we get this really nice phase transition curve. And this is kind of like um, the type of curve you would see, you know, we talked about before, if you have something like water and you, and you increase the temperature, um, it's, it's not going to need any more space, you know? So you can imagine sort of how much uh, volume you need for your water is going to be at some small constant. And then suddenly you turn into steam and this thing is going to turn into a steam engine and sort of move and you can move a whole train with this stuff. Uh, so this idea of phase transition is really at the heart of, of complex systems and a lot of modern science. And I think this is just a really fascinating sort of very simple math model, mathematical model that has this sort of dimmer switch along the x-axis you're smoothly continuously changing the value of this dimmer switch and then boom at some point the lights just kind of turn on right you can imagine you would not want a real dimmer switch to operate this way right this is like a terrible shower right so you can imagine this is like way too cold and way too hot and you have like a knob that you're trying to turn right and if you turn it just like a little bit that way boom now it's too icy cold and if you turn it just a little bit more that way it's like boom now it's too hot right and so in some situations, that's what you want, is that thresholded type behavior. All right, so if you haven't already, make sure you go through and document this notebook, rewrite this code for yourself so that you can, you can explain it later at another time to yourself. Uh, can, you, can you go over um, the part of the code that um, changed the colors? Um, yeah, which colors, uh, which colors? After you got like yellow and purple, I don't understand, how do you add in like the green and the turquoise? Like what is LW comma origin equals lower? What is that? Uh, up, it should be go up or down. Let me, uh, let's see. Not this part. No, um, earlier on. So one thing to, to remember is that the colors are kind of false colors. So all of these are really in black and white. So if we were to print out like this matrix here, it's really, there's one number that's gray, another number that's orange, another number that's blue, another one that's green. And that colors, the colors are defined with the color map. So let's take a look at that. I was more like referring to like, so you get LW comma num equals measurements dot label M. Like what, what is that? Uh, oh, okay, all the way back up here. What is yeah, that that's what, Yeah, so this is, this, is, this is the part I was saying that we can kind of just glaze over for right now. We're not gonna um, we're not gonna go into too much detail with that particular code. That just kind of makes this demonstration to color these in different colors, and so okay, that's okay. That, that, that's a package that's built into um, sci uh, scientific Python, and it's gonna create this sort of measurements this measurements tool. So that came in uh, right it's here based on value. Okay, never mind. I get it. Yes. So this is a this is a toolbox. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the only reason we're not going to go into this because I, I, we're not really going to use this in other experiments. I just thought it was useful to show for this. So it's a package called n-dimensional image, and it's part of scientific Python, and it has this measurements tool. And so if we give that a matrix, it will measure these clusters. So this is a specialized package designed for sort of measuring clusters in 2D images. Does that kind of answer that question? That does answer it. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Uh, so hopefully the next notebook will help. Uh, explain some more about this. Okay, so and one one more quick question. Uh, when yeah, you please. Say we're gonna glaze over those, so we don't need to know any because anything about it. Because when I was trying to go over the notebooks, some of the things it, it seemed like I should know a little bit about it in order to even understand. Yeah, what... I mean, there's sort of yeah, there's sort of different levels of um, you know, definitely run this and and be you know go and look into it. And I and, and we can if there's interest, I'd be happy to. It's just that. I didn't look too much into what these are doing. I just liked uh, what this was showing here, and I wanted this demonstration um, of the size of these, so I knew that this would do that for us. Um, I can look into it later and kind of go through and about how it's measuring it and that sort of thing. Um, 
Yeah. What's that? Yeah, they're just counting the size of the cluster. So it's saying, you know, define define a region of connected as a as a cluster, and then and then give them each their own uh, color based, and then based on their size. So it actually measures the area, and then it will color them in based on that area value. And so what I mean by by you know don't stress about it is we're not gonna we're not gonna go in and look at the measurements in in detail. We'll leave that as sort of a black box tool. Um. And, and just leave it kind of as that, you know, with Python from a practical point of view, you know, I'm going to try to make everything sort of mathematical that we can go through and look at all the math details. So I apologize that this one is a sort of a black box that just does this, this picture. So the, the rest of the, the stuff will sort of be less of that type. Um, in general, from a practical point of, you know, practical side as graduate students and students, you want to, you do want to be able to work with code you don't understand, right? What I mean by that is, you know, you think about your cell phone or your laptop, there's not a single human being or even a small collection of human beings that understands your cell phone, right? And I, and I really truly mean that because if you imagine, right, okay, say they're experts in the software design. Well, which software? The object-oriented graphical user interface, right? The, the, the matrix multiplier, hardware accelerator chips. You've got experts in semiconductor, quantum mechanics. You have interface design. You have the person who designs the glass and that's a whole sort of material science itself. You have the battery physics and the electronics of the battery and that. You have the safety implications and all this. Uh, and that's not even started them on the radio physics. So these things are extraordinarily complicated. This is what it means to be a scientist in this modern world. And so you do want to be able to learn how to run Python blocks of code and get answers out of them where, you know, how it does it and all that is really just might be the, beyond the scope of your experiment, what you're trying to do or whatever. Um, so there's certain like sort of comfort zones that will we'll sort of have and say, well, that we're not going to go into too much of the details. Uh, we're going to try to keep all this class at sort of the level of, of mathematics, right? And that's what I like to do. So I apologize if this little section of code is confusing uh, in terms of this measurements and label type stuff. So uh, we won't see more of that though. Okay, so let me go to the other one and hopefully that'll, that'll make some more sense what I'm talking about. Okay, so... Uh, Briefly, I wanted to show a clip from this documentary. This is one of my favorites. Um, this came out, I think, in the 70s in the Soviet Union. And it's a fantastic documentary. I just want to show this one clip. You'll, you're going to watch this later. But it's this idea of excitable media. So the, the audio is low, so I'm gonna uh, I'm just gonna read this part. So they have this example with these little uh, these little candles, and uh, hopefully you can see this. It's a kind of an old grainy, blurry video, but they have these little matches here. And what they're gonna show is that when you light one match, it's gonna light the match next to it. And so this is our forest fire model. And I just thought it was really cool to show sort of a physical model, right? So we can really appreciate these awesome digital machinery, these awesome digital computing machines, because people, you know, they used to have to kind of run these experiments with like actual fire. Uh, let me jump ahead to the second to the, the section here okay so here they have they're describing this little candle so this is it's hard to see but this is a little jar of oil and this is a little candle um like a little oil lamp but it's an it's an asbestos wick as they describe it and what's going to happen is this is a very thick oil and so the oil will very slowly rise up this wick coat the wick and then you can set this on fire but what happens with this little particular cam this little particular candle module is that the, the, the rise of the oil is so slow that the fire will burn itself out before the next blob, blob of oil gets there. And so it'll go out. But then if you let it sit for a second, the oil does come up. And so you can then light it again a few seconds later. So it's sort of like a trick candle that will light and then it will put itself out a few seconds later. And then you can light it again after a minute, after a couple of seconds more. So what's really neat is they made a whole bunch of these Right? It's sort of like analog demonstration. So they made a whole bunch of these and they're gonna put them in a whole array. So here he's lit, in, he's lit the, the, the lamp. In a second, he's gonna blow it out. Or it's, I'm sorry, it's just gonna go out. He doesn't have to blow it out. It's just gonna go out on its own because the oil ran out on the top wick. Now, if he tries to light it right now, it won't light right away. So this models a period of inhibition this is like how heart cells and how neurons operate. There's sort of an excitation and then an inhibition. You can no longer excite this thing right now. But if you wait just a few more seconds, now the oil has risen up again and you can actually light this. So this is what's called an excitable media. 
And this is a sort of a base model that represents an extraordinary wide range of phenomena. And so what they do is they put these all into a cascade. They make sort of a, a tiled array of these little lamps. And then you get the forest fire model. Let's see if we can see this here. So now they've lined them up one in a line. This is in a straight line. And you can see if one lights the next, which then goes out, but it's just been able to write the one after that. And so now we have this sort of traveling pattern that's sort of going down, going down the line. And so this is what we're going to try to map, model mathematically with our forest fire. And then we're going to see how this same model, we can use it to model waves across your heart or excitation across a neuron or a whole bunch of other variety of phenomena. Okay, so let me jump in. Then they put them in a two-dimensional array and you get, it looks like a forest fire from overhead, right? So this is a whole table full of these little lamps. Each, it's hard, you can't resolve them in the picture, but each one of these little spots is one of those little lamps. And then you're getting this sort of excitation wave going across. Okay, so be sure to, to watch this documentary this evening. We'll come probably come back to it in just a minute. Okay. Let's wake up the notebook here. We're gonna bring in some, some, some import. So we're gonna import, um, again, a lot of this kind of stuff, we're just gonna drop these blocks in and this is gonna say, add, these are some of the tools that we're gonna use for our experiments. Okay, now what we can do is we can create our own custom functions that we're gonna use later. Some of the things in Python, they're just, they're the way they are and they're not super mathematical and we're just gonna kind of leave them as tools. So this one is called make animation that I've written for us and this will make an animation block. One thing that helps is you can kind of hide these things, right? We can click this little, uh, little Chevron looking thing here and we can hide that and that will make that uh, a smaller amount. This little code again is just gonna provide us with a plotting capability. We can go through and look at the details of this in a minute. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, Matt. So we are in the um, we are on the complex systems GitHub, and then we'll scroll down to the notebooks, and we're going to find the one that says convolution and PDE. Okay, so we're we've got our notebook convolution PDE. We've made a couple base. Uh, uh, subroutine, some functions that we're going to use later to make it easier for us. We've defined this, this verb plot. And basically to make something with graphics on the screen, these are the set of commands we need, but I don't want to have to type that each time. So what we'll do is we'll just make a new verb called to plot. And if we send it this, this variable X, it will do this set of instructions on that, on that. So now if we run this, we have our upload function here. I'm sorry, our image read, not upload. Our image read, I'm going to do control two and split those into a couple blocks so I can see it separately. So this is going to go and use the IO function that we brought in. We brought in scikit image import IO as IO. But in general, all we now have is an IM read function. What's really amazing is we can just give this a URL and this will just go out onto the internet and it will find this, this picture. I chose this old video game because it has some lines that we're going to look at. Okay, so we were able to just put in a directly from a URL. That's really awesome. You know, it wasn't that long ago getting an image into your, into your computer language was not easy to do. Now we've used our new verb to plot and we've given it this data object, this uh, array image. If we look at what image is, I like to just run things like that. We can see it's an array. I think the most important command that we're gonna use is dot shape that tells us the size that this, this data exists as on the computer, it's 512 by 640 by four. Does anybody know why it's four, has four channels? Zero compatible color. Close, it's, it's actually, it's red, green, and blue, and then a transparency channel. So this is RGB. Compatible color. Yeah, so that's just like you're saying. <laughs> so it's R, R green, red, green, and blue, and then an alpha channel. And so let's take a look at what that looks like. There's plot image. 
There's plot image shape. Let's look at just the red channel. So let's look at image. One of the most important things that we'll work on a lot is what I call the wild card, which is the, the colon. And so what that's going to say is if we say image colon, 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 that's kind of redundant. That just means everything. But let's look at it anyway. And let's look at plot, image colon, colon, colon. That will mean all of the rows. We want to plot all of the rows, all of the columns, and all of the color channels. And it will plot the same thing. If we put in here a zero, then that will only plot the red channel. And let's see if that kind of we can make sense of that. So all of this stuff is in red here. So this should be bright. It is. So now let's look at the second channel, the green channel, by putting a one here. And now let's go see where was some green in the picture, right? These things and these things. So let's go see if they're bright white in the picture. And they are. And so we can see that in this version, we don't have the green lines, but we have the red part. And in this version, we don't have the red part. We have these green lines. And let's see, is there any blue in that picture? I don't think there is. No, there's not really any blue in there, but we can look at that channel anyway. And so we can see that's only the stuff that's going to come through on that channel because the red and it's going to subtract everything that's not red and green. So we're basically just going to be left with that there. Okay, so now what we can do is let's take a look at, let's look at image.shape again. Okay, so it's got four channels. So let's cut one of them off. Let's do image equals image. Or let's, well, we can, uh, let's see, I think we have it right down here. Yep, I have it right here already. Let me move this up. So I'm gonna, I selected, I clicked on this first block. Then I click, held down shift, I clicked on the second one, and then I'm going to move the up arrow and move both of these cells up next to this block. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to average, we're going to do the mean of this data over axis 2, right? So it always counts as 0, so it's 0, 1, 2. So we're going to average all over those channels and create our black and white version of that. If we now plot out image dot shape. We can see that the last dimension is gone. It is now just a matrix of six of uh, 512 by 640. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to make a little filter, we're going to sort of do a, we're going to look in this image for features of this type, right? So we're going to do a few examples of this. So we're going to just have this thing that we're going to be looking for. Let's not worry about why right now. Let's just say we're looking for something that has one, two, one, zero, 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 and minus one, minus two, minus one. And we want to know, is that particular pattern, we can think of that as a really tiny image, right? Let's plot that as a little image. Let's do plot A. And that's a little image, and it looks like this. And so we want to know, is in, in, in our big image, in this whole image of this whole, the, uh, the full version in black and white, is there anywhere in this image that has a pattern that looks like this? And so we're going to use this convolution operator. We're going we're gonna to write it from scratch. But for right now, let's use the built-in. So we want to see how we can use built-in tools and then code them ourselves. So we'll use this tool called Convolve. We'll look in a second how that works. And that's going to give us an output. So we're going to give it an image, this matrix. We're going to give it the little filter A, and then we're going to tell it we want the output to be the same size. And if we run that convolution and we filter it, what we can see is what it's done is it's filtered our image, and it's returned only the parts that have a horizontal structure that go left to right. And if we look at our, our image and we kind of squint, we can see it sort of has a sort of a, a stripe across the middle there. So now what we can do is let's rotate that filter. Let's use the transpose, the matrix transpose, and we'll just turn it so it's one, two, one, zero, 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 and minus one, minus two, minus one. Let's plot it again just to see what that looks like. Don't be afraid to like break up each line of code into as many as you need to kind of see each piece. When I write these codes, it's, it's very much the condensed version so I can show it on the screen easier. When I write these the, the first time, I write 
hundreds of little lines in between to make sure I'm on the right step. Okay, so now we can see this is going to be looking for a vertical edge. And so when we run that one on the convolution and take our output, we're gonna get a filtered version of the input, except now it's extracted only vertical features. So now we have two copies of our input. We have one that only has horizontal lines and the other that only has vertical lines. So if we you know, needed to make a decision about this picture, this would help us. We can convolve with a blurry filter. If we just make a big random filter, this will mix up all the pixels with all the pixels around it. And we can get a blurry image if we want that. Okay, so imagine you're a self-driving car. So let's bring in another image. We'll go to a URL. This is just a random picture that I found. Feel free to change out this JPEG. You can go anywhere on the internet and find another JPEG, drop it in. This is gonna say, give me just the red channel. We're going to change it into, sometimes when we bring in the images, let's, let's, let's take a look here. Let me split this. So let's bring in that image. And now let's look at this variable. I call it X, right? As, sort of, as a mathematician, I just recycle the variables all the time. In general, feel free to rename these. So let's look at X.shape. So we see that this is a matrix. It's uh, 371 by 660. And if we look at just the values, we can see that they are whole numbers. So they are whole numbers that take the value between 0 and 255. This has to do with the amount of memory that has historically been allocated on a computer for each pixel. Right, right now, we don't realize it, but the computers we have have an outrageous amount of memory. It used to be that memory was extraordinarily expensive and people wanted to save it. And but. For historical reasons, we use eight bits of memory. And so that means when you load in a photograph, a dark, a, a, the darkest squares will be zero and the brightest squares will be 255. It's a, sort of, it's, a, it's a measure of, it's like a simulation of analog photography. So what we want to do is we want to convert these to numbers between zero and one. So the way we do that is first we tell it that we want to turn it into a floating point number, right? As a mathematician, you might not have ever heard of this, but that just means make it a decimal. So if we look at this again, we can now see that it actually put a little decimal place. So it's not 100 even, it's 100 dot. And on the computer, that makes a difference. And now we know that the largest value in this is going to be, two, is going to be 255, and we want that to be a 1. So we want the brightest pixel to be, to be a 1, sort of 100% brightness. And so we just divide by the maximum. And we can do this slick thing called divide equal. So in general, we have these operators where we can do... Uh, we have plus equals and minus equals and star equals. And what that's going to do is that's the same thing. So if we do x equals x plus equals 1 is the same thing as x equals whatever x was and add to it 1. Right? So it's just your sort of preference about how you like to code this. So we might want to say that x is equal to x, whatever x was, divided by 255. Okay, now let's run that. We can plot it as the plot. The plot won't make any difference. The plot will look exactly the same. But if we were to reprint now x, that's why I like to put these blocks in and actually reprint out the variables at times. Now we can verify, okay, good. Now they're numbers. They're, they're not smaller than zero. They're not bigger than one. And now we're, we're good. Okay, so now we're going to look at this convolution operation itself. To do that, I'm going to jump back up to this website that has a nice little interactive graphic. If we go all the way up to the top, Let's do image kernels explained visually. There's a nice link there. And then we'll get to kind of see this uh, in this nice little web app. So what we have here is we have a picture. Here's the person. Here's a little picture uh, here on the right, sort of the actual pixel scale. Then we have the pixels sort of oversized so we can see them. And then on the left here, we can see the pixels. Here they are whole numbers between 0 and 255. So if we go to the bright square, it's 255. If we go to the dark square, uh, that one says 20. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at our, our kernel here. So let's uh, look at our filters. So we had one that looked something like this. Let's see. 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 1. So what we're doing is we're taking our image. We're taking our image and we're creating another image. So we have input as an image and the output is going to be an image. 
And the way we're going to determine what the output is, is for every pixel on the input, we take it and we use this little recipe that we just defined. So we had one, two, one, zero, 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 minus one, minus two, minus one. And we're going to use that to weight these little values in the square. And we're going to get that pixel was 177, multiply it by a one. That one, 178, multiply it by a two. We multiply them all together, add them all up, add them all up. That will be the new center pixel, and that's the output. We're going to do that at every possible location. Every possible location. And that'll give us the output. The only problem is we can't do it at the very first pixel. So if you notice, these pixels on the edges here are empty, and that's because our system isn't defined. If we go all the way up to this first corner, well, we have to be asking about what one pixel is up and over, and there is no one pixel up and over. Then what we could do is we're going to then change all of these. If we look at um, one of interest might be the identity. And so the identity does nothing. It says, take whatever pixel you were in the middle, multiply it by a one, multiply a zero by all the pixels, and then add them together. Well, that does nothing except for clip the edge around the outside. Okay, so that's what we've done here. We've created our filter, one, two, one, zero, 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 minus one, minus two, minus one. That's our filter. We filtered it, and that gave us the output on that image. Okay, so now let's look at how we actually do that. Let me uh, pull up the whiteboard for a second. Let me turn the light on here. Convolution operation, it's really, it's really simple. We're going to go to a pixel, right? We're going to pretend like we're an agent, right? In general, it helps with these algorithms to pretend like you're sort of miniature and you're standing on this giant graph paper world. And then we're going to try to figure out what the value of the pixel of you're going to be. So you're a pixel and you have a value and you've been asked to change your value based on what your neighbors are. And that's what this convolution operation represents. All right, so can, can everyone see on this board if I, if I use this red ink? You see that? Yeah. Okay. So let's pretend like we're in the middle of our image. We're somewhere inside of this giant image, and we're going to be looking at this for loop here. And so can you also still see the screen? Can you see I can see it. Yep. We can't see you that well. You can see it, but not that well? Yeah, a little bit. Small. Okay, let me just try to draw a giant. So we're going to pretend like we're somewhere in this image and we're on this giant pixel array and we're standing at one giant pixel here and we're going to be at pixel i, comma j. And that's the pixel that I'm at. And I want to update my, the, myself based on my neighbors. So if I'm on I row, um, on the ith row in the column J, right? So I is going to be the row, and J is going to be the column. So if we're in the center square and we go over one square, right? So we're sort of going to be looking at our neighbors. Let's draw the neighbors here. So this would then be still the ith row, but we have J plus 1. And this would be the i throw and j minus one. If we're, so we're trying to figure out what our neighbor pixels are relative to where we are. So we can write this code. And then if we're in this spot, we're going to be in row i plus one, but we're still in the j column. And if we're in this one, we're in i plus one, j plus one. Move the cameras on the other side. Oh, my, okay. So we're trying to figure out, so now let me jump to the code to kind of show this here. We have our center pixel, xi of j. That's going to correspond with our, the, the, our filter. So let's look at our filter. We called it lowercase a. Now the way we can index a so adding adding the plus sign um, in the for loop in front of each of the lines uh, ends up summing it. 
Yeah, so yeah, great question. So because I, 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 I did what's called wrap this line. So I use this, this special character here. This special character means ignore all the white space and just continue on the next line. And so this is this character is a special Python character. It's, this is not math character, this last slash. This is just going to be continue the next line. So we could write this out as one big line. Let me just kind of show you that. Oh, I see. Okay. Never mind. I just kind of wanted to emphasize the symmetry. So we could do this like, you know, put these all like this. Does that make sense? I get it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so by doing it this way, we can kind of see the symmetry. And now let's look at this thing. So this, this value in the middle, let's look at the very middle pixel, right? These things, it's confusing because it starts counting with zero. So if we do A00, that's going to be the very first thing here. If we do A11, that's going to be this one because we're in the, the, the one row and the one column. And since it starts at zero, that's going to be this middle one. So that's this filter. We're saying take the middle, take whatever pixel you are and multiply it by your middle filter. So whatever pixel you are, right? I can't both use the mouse and this thing at the same time because it is the mouse. But whatever pixel you are, you then multiply it by the neighbor. So you can think of uh, this one here. Right, this value here is sort of the center value for, for this. And so we want to multiply it by the middle of that pixel. And so that's pixel IJ. So we multiply pixel IJ by the I by filter one one. Now if we go into the this corner, right, this is going to be filter two two. And so we use filter two, two, and that's going to be I plus one, J plus one, right? So this is going to be our, our, our pixel and then the neighbors, the eight neighbors around it. Is that clear how the I, the, the, the I, J and the, and the plus and minus one work? So, so do this yourself, write this out on paper, uh, write these out and turn, make yourself a little diagram so you can see, you know, how these, how the A corresponds to these, these different nine locations. So we have nine locations in our filter, and then we have a spot that we're at plus our eight neighbors. And so our next value in the IJ spot for X2 is going to be the sum of whatever you are plus all of your neighbors weighted by the filter, whatever F, whatever F is. Okay, so if we run that, and we run our input through a convolution, so this is doing our, our homemade version from scratch, convolution. And then if we plot that, we can see it's filtered our roadway. And so if we're a self-driving car, that might be an easier version of that to look at. So what we can do is let's, let's do this three times. Each time we're going to make up a random filter. So we're going to make up a random number, random matrix. We're going to filter our image and then we'll plot that out. So we can see kind of what random filters do to these images. They extract different features. Let's run this a few more times. Let's run it 10 times. And so we can see they're doing things. Some are, some are just blurring it. Some are most of the kind of the identity. Some sort of invert it. These are sort of emphasizing the edge structure there. So depending on what it is you're trying to answer about the question about this picture, you can get that different ways. Okay, so let's time this. Let's see how long our method takes. So we have um, a random matrix. We're gonna create nine of them. We're gonna do this thing nine times. We're gonna start the timer. We're gonna say, hey, what time is it? Put that into our memory. We'll run this thing nine times. When it's done, we'll say how long it's been. So we're gonna say, take whatever time it is now and subtract what time you started it. And that'll be the difference. And then it will print this out in seconds. This is kind of a fancy way to print. I'm just going to change this to make it a little clearer for you guys.
Okay, so it's running that nine times. We'll give it a second here. Okay, and so it took 10 seconds to do that. So about one second to do each one of those, right? You can imagine if you were to print that out and do it by hand on graph paper, it would probably take you about an hour, maybe longer. Okay, now we're going to use the built-in code. We're going to use this uh, the same function, but not our version. This one's sort of been optimized, and we're going to see that that one takes less than a second, right? Less than a tenth of a second. So just it, it's really helpful to write our own code so that we know how things work, but we have to remember that some of these some of these packages have been optimized, and so we can just know that it does the same thing, but it's going to do it faster. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to use something really cool called the graphics processing unit. So I don't know if we've talked about this yet. But one thing that's really cool about this, this program that we're using, Colabs, if you go to Notebook Settings, it will give us a graphics accelerator. It will give us a really nice graphics accelerator. This, this will give you, you know, like a, you know, like a $5,000, $6,000 computer in the cloud for free. So we're going to run this, but uh, we're going we're gonna to do it not nine times. We're going to do it 96 times. And so let's run that and see how long that takes. Might take a second to kind of wake up the GPU. Okay, so that one took only three one hundredths of a second, and it did it 96 times, right? So now we're sort of hitting at this area, this overlap between, you know, math and complexity. That this, just because there's something we can do, you know, how long did it take to do it? All right, so think of how many how more often you could run this one versus running the other. Okay, so now we can do this in color. We can do the same kind of a thing. Let's bring in a color image. Let's bring in these nice fish here. So we'll just put in a URL. Now we'll plot that same plot command. We'll bring our, our image. Now let's make a uh, random filter. So this is what a random filter would look like in color. It's just sort of a random picture. Now, the way we're using um, a certain tool called PyTorch, and if we go back up here, so here we're going to have a, a subtle thing where typically with an image, we think of the rows, the columns, and then the color channels, the red, green, and blue. The language that we're going to be using called PyTorch, it likes that three in the front. It likes to have the, the color channels and then the rows and columns. And so we can use a tool called Transpose and we can say, hey, take whatever was in index two and put it in the first one and whatever was in zero, put it, and it sort of rearranges things in this new order. So this is the new order for things. And so if we look at that and then run image.shape, we can see it just put that, that three out front. Now, the only trouble is if we try to run that through the plot command we ran before, unless we make some modifications, it's going to say, oh, I don't know what to do with that because it expects the third one to be in color. But we can either rewrap we can rewrite our plot command to handle that, or we can um, just reshape it before we send it to plot. Okay, so we'll make up a random filter. I'm gonna make up 11 pixels by 11 pixels with three color channels. And then the way this, uh, this system works, it likes to do lots of work at once. And so this system is gonna do this sort of batch mode that we're gonna get into a lot. So it's gonna, it likes to sort of, like when we answer questions as humans, you normally think of answering one question at a time. But what they're going to do is they're going to do it lots of things at a time. So it's going to expect a whole list of filters. So we're going to give it a list of one. So we're saying, yeah, it's a whole list, but it's just a list of one. And so now we have an image. The image is in color. There are three color channels. The image has 599 rows. It has, uh, it has uh, 10,024 columns. And there's one image in this stack of images. The system has to give, you have to give it a lot of work. So it expects a whole batch of work. So even if it's just one thing, you still tell it it's a list. Not a list, but a, a batch. Okay, now we're going to turn these into tensors. So we're going to use this language called PyTorch. And to do that, we just have to take our normal data and we just say, hey, this is a tensor. And so now we're going to use the torches version of convolution. It's called capital F.cov2. And it's going to do the same thing we wrote from scratch. Okay, so now we've taken our color image and we ran it with our filter and this was the output. So what happened to the colors? 
Well, there's never going to be any color when we, when we filter a color image with a color filter. The only thing that's coming back is sort of a map of where in that image that feature had been found. And so that map will always be in black and white. So that's just to kind of show the convolution operations. Now let's, let's do this another example that'll make a little more, in, more sense intuitively about what we're actually doing here. So let's bring in Mario. So there's our, our picture of a Mario world. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna crop that image. So this image is now just a set of numbers. We can look at it image. It's those sets of numbers. You can see they go from zero to 255. Now I carefully went and I found one of these coins and I told it, well, if you go, if you start at row 185 and you stop at row 200, and if you start at row 224 and you stop at row 239 and you take all the color channels and we crop the image in that location, we get this coin, all right? So there's a, just a, a matrix of where that coin has been found. And so there we can crop it out. Now what we can do is let's scale these numbers between zero and one. So you can see how what this is going to do is it'll subtract the minimum and then divide by the range. And so that'll make it the, to scale things. Now we're going to average to get, make these a black and white image and scale them. So now we have a black and white version of the Mario world. We have a black and white version of the coin. I subtract the average. We can still see that now these are numbers. These are small numbers. They have a chance of being negative. Uh, we could probably change it and rescale it. I think it's just how I had to scale. Well, I subtract the mean after I scaled it, so we can rearrange it. But okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to convolve. In this case, we're using this the the, the PyTorch, uh, not the PyTorch version in this case, but this is the NumPy. We're going to take our image and our filter. So I happen to rotate it. Let me put this on its own line. I'll say, so I'm going to say the coin equals the coin rotate 92. And so if we just look at the plot coin again, we can see it's just flipped backwards. And you think, well, why did we do that? It just happens to do with the technical definition of convolution, it expects your filter to be flipped. And so if we're looking for the coin itself, we want to flip it. And that way, when it runs the convolution, it will flip it back and then look for the coin. So we're going to run our convolution with image and coin and look at the output. So we have our convolution. Let me uh, make this bigger. Hang on a second. I can make these plots a little larger. Let's see if I go to the plot command here. And this says 8 by 8. Let's make this larger. I don't know, 15 by 15 or something for our pictures. I'm going to rechange that size. So now I've redefined our plot verb. Let me scroll back down. Okay, so that one, the coin's probably too large, but now we can see this one better. Okay, so now what we've done is right here, we convolved, we did convolution of our image with our coin, and we got out this feature map. This is a map of where in this image, this feature can be found. And we see that we get white spots in these locations here. If we ask it to say where in this image Z, Z is this output, where is it equal to the max equals equals. So let's run that by itself. Let's see Z. Okay, Z is all these, these numbers here. We can say, what is np.max? What is the largest that Z gets? It's that number. We can say, where is Z equal to? So the actual equal sign to comparison is double equals. One equals means take the thing on the right and put it in the variable named on the left. The double equals says, are these things the same thing? And so it'll say, no, 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 no. But there will be one, a couple locations where they are that brightest value. And it's namely these locations here, 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 and here. And so we can then find, we can say, where are those? So if we then say, we can use the where function and say, where are they equal? And it will say in these rows with these columns. So it's actually giving us the location and then we can take those locations and plot them, and we get those uh, eight dots there. 
And now we can plot those back on top of the original image and we can see that we have our coin detector, right? So we've used convolution as a feature finder. We, have a fe we had a feature of the coin. We had the original input map. We ran the convolution and the convolution is asking the question, where are these things the same? The filter matches the most when it overlaps with the coin directly. That gives us the actual location for the coin. And so now we've used convolution to find these coins. Okay, any questions on that so far? Because that's kind of a lot. We're going to go over this. Yeah, yeah, please. I'm kind of confused about why you first made the image black and white and then also why you had to flip the coin and then flip it back. Yeah, the flipping the coin has to do with a, a, the way this particular version of Convolve is defined um, in that it will first flip whatever filter you give it. And this is just the definition that a lot of, um, a lot of Convolve operations use. And this is just for other, other reasons. Um, Does flipping it and changing it to black and white have anything to do with like the answers we're trying to get or make, making it black and white just kind of simplified the problem. Essentially, um, we can go back and try to run it in color. It's a great idea. Essentially, like the task is the same. So in general, like, could you play Mario? Like, is Mario almost as much fun on a black and white TV? Yeah. Right. My cousin's house, we played on a black and white TV and stuff. Right. So, yeah, it's still fun, but it doesn't have anything to do with the game, right? So you don't, you're not gonna, you're not gonna add, you're not gonna add anything to it. And it would make the problem, um, makes the problem simpler, but leaves the problem alone in a sense. Now, the good question would be, can we just go ahead and change this out and leave it in color? So maybe I'll leave that as sort of an exercise for homework. I'll put some hints in there. I have a question. So yeah understanding and please correct me if i'm wrong if you're changing it to a black and just reducing the dimensions so you don't have to deal with three channels exactly one. exactly so that's what makes it kind of simplify it is the filter and the image are now just two-dimensional so the the image input is 2d and the filter is 2d uh we can and will do 3d convol you know convolutions with color uh but it seems like this was just an easier way to simplify the problem then I was wondering, just to follow up, so basically, the, probably you'd flip the coin because that would increase the variability, or um, you flip up the coin just to, to make No, it. it's, 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 really just, it's really just like a historical definition of the convolution operator. What's that? Oh, no. Um, that... The, the, with the with the traditional mathematical definition of convolution, the filter is is flipped. So here we have an input in blue and then a filter in red. And that to do the classic defin like the the definition of convolution, you fit you flip this first and then sort of do this correlation where you slide one past the other. Here's a one dimensional example. In the modern in the modern machine learning world, they don't flip it anymore. It's sort of just not flipped. Um, and so it's it's. I would say it's just really a historical accident. If we run, and we can try this, if we run our own homemade version of Cov, we probably won't have, we don't have to flip it. So let me see. Um, it doesn't, I know, so we don't have to flip it. We call it Cov 2D, right? So let's go back up and look at our homemade um, loop here. There it is, Cov 2D, uh, Cov 2. Okay, so let's comment out that version. And now let's go back and run these again. Let's just run it from the beginning. And now I'm gonna skip the flip line. Let's see where that is. Okay, here's the rotate. I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so now we have the original coin with the, the dark side on that side. And now let's see if we can run 
our version that worked good. Yeah, but that didn't come out. That didn't work. Hmm. Okay, I'll have to go back and see what, what it was I added it for this, what was different about ours. No, it's a great question though. In general, we won't have to worry about the flip. I'm trying to remember now, I wrote this a while back. I'm trying to remember why ours was different. Um, I don't really know, but does it have anything to do with the fact that our matrix before was only nine? Like it was three by three, the coin is bigger than that. Yes, that yes, thank you so much. Yes, that's exactly why. Wow, I cannot yeah. believe that I just guessed that. No. No, it's fantastic. Yes, thank you. Yes, ours was hand coded. Yes, exactly right. So ours was hand coded explicitly for only a three, and that we'd have to completely rewrite the formula and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, great point. So that's why. Okay, um, we'll, we'll we'll do a fun exercise later though. We can we can we can still code that. That's not hard to do. Okay, so we found the coin, we placed the coin, and then we we put the red dot. So really, the the purpose of this is to show that we can think of convolution as sort of finding something that you give it something you want it to look for and it will give you out a feature map and the key of this map is this map will always be in black and white even if we ran the image and the coin in color the output map here would still be in black and white because it's a location it's it's a where in that image in space was it the did it match the most and so we're getting these bright spots where it matches the most Okay, so that's convolution. So that's kind of how we can use it to find something. The other thing that we can use it for is to count things. And so now we're gonna use this for this fun thing called Game of Life, which I'm gonna switch over to another program real quick, uh, just to kind of show this. And this is called Golly. So Golly is a really awesome free program. Uh, download this yourself this afternoon. I think I put this, uh, I might've put the link, if not, let me just show you how you find this. I'll put the link on the GitHub. So if you just type in Golly Cellular Automata, it will pop right up. And then I'll put this onto the GitHub. Uh, and then you can download a copy here. So just click here and it'll take you over to SourceForge and then it'll download, it'll, it'll guess what operating system you're on. It knows I'm on a Windows computer here. So it's gonna give me, suggest me the Windows version, which works fine. So if we open up that program, we get this, this kind of world. And this is really fun. This is sort of like a professional um, cellular automata program. And uh, it allows us, it gives us a little pen here. And so I have a little pen and I can, and I can click here and then I can hit go and stuff's gonna happen, right? And so we have to say, well, what in the world happened? Uh, we can clear this. So what this is, this is going to be the game of life. This is a, a, a mathematical game that was invented on paper, actually played it on the floor in the 1970s by a guy named John Conway. Unfortunately, he, uh, he just passed away this year. Uh, I think it was, was it February? Yeah. So as you can see here, they're paying homage to him, but he had a good run. And um, so this guy, John Conway, he came up with this game and his students as sort of a simple mathematical thing um, to, to simulate the game of life. And so what does that mean? What it means is if you are, if you, the squares are alive, the white squares, and, and, and uh, if, if you hit go, they're going to apply this rule. And the rule says if you're by yourself, you're going to disappear. Boop. You were lonely. And so one square by itself will die of loneliness. If we have uh, four squares in a row, it will stay just how it is. It will stay stable as a square forever. If we put in a line like that, it'll just disappear. If we put in three across, it will oscillate forever. And so let's look at these uh, sort of game of life. Okay, so any cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies as if by underpopulation. Any cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation, next time step. 
Any cell with more than three live neighbors dies as if overpopulation. And any cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell as if by reproduction. So any dead cell. Okay, so it looks like they, they reformulated these into a slightly different, let's see what the condensed version is. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors survives. Any dead cell with three live neighbors becomes a live cell. All other cells die in the next generation. Similarly, all dead cells stay dead. Okay, so this is a ridiculously simple uh, model of, of life, if we can even call it that. And we're gonna code this up in, 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 in Python for, from, by, from scratch, but it's kind of fun to look at what actually happens in this world because it's extraordinarily counterintuitive, ridiculously powerful. It shows up over and over again. And it's one of those things when I first came across this 20 years ago or so, I was like, oh, that's cool. I remember downloading a screensaver of it and like ran it on my computer. And it was like, I don't know, I just thought it was like a neat pattern or something like this. It turns out this is really at the heart of computation and a lot of, it's a really great model that gets a lot of really interesting ideas. All right, so what can you do with this? Like NetLogo, this program is chock full of fun stuff that you can click on and play. And so they have all of these different categories here. So let's start with life. And then we can see they have all of these different kind of things that we can, we can put in. First, let's just kind of start with some, let's start like a smiley face or something, right? Let's put something fun. Oh, it's a terrible smiley. Okay, so let's just put in a smiley face and hit run. And if you think, what will happen, right? So in general, we think of algorithms like we know the rules. We know exactly what's rule, right? We went through the only three or four of those rules, depending on which formulation you want to look at. And we we'll say, well, what's going to happen after I run this thing 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times? What squares will be on? And if you think you can predict what squares will be on after some amount of time, right, you're kidding yourself because what happens is rather outrageous. And so we get this sort of transient behavior where stuff is all moving around. We sort of set off some fireworks here. Now, already we see this, this, these things called glider guns, these guns here, or these gliders here, rather. We'll see the glider gun in a minute. And so now we've got things that are moving around like particles. We've got little sort of little flurries of activity, like a, like a fight at a coral reef. And then now we've got things kind of stabili stabilizing off a little bit. I can imagine like a great sports, sports contester, right? Sports uh, commentator. All right, we've got oscillations, oscillations, oscillations. We're stuck in the regime now, right? So now they, we've now hit a steady state, and now this thing will now just, you know, stay like this and oscillate back and forth forever. Now the question is, you know, what can you build out of these things? And you can make some really crazy kind of stuff. And people have come up with all these outrageous patterns. And so what we can do is we can speed this up. We can slow it down with plus and minus. And this is, this is really extraordinary, right? This is just crazy stuff. I wish I had learned about this you know, sooner and taken it seriously sooner. Um, because what in the world is happening here? I think this is really a model of a lot of different things. And what are models, right? They're just total abstraction. So it's nothing like anything in the real world. But is this, is this like how cellular biology and proteins come together? This is certainly a model for nanotechnology. So when you think of something like a Star Trek replicator, where they can say, make me a, you know, a soda or a sandwich or something, and they push the button, and this is how it's going to assemble it, right? It's going to be something like this, probably not in two, obviously not in two dimensions. But if we look at all these extraordinary structures in here, you know, what is happening in this thing, right? So there's all kinds of crazy, uh, crazy things you can make happen here. Let me see if I can speed this one up. This one's spitting out the word golly, the name of this program, right? So they're truly universal in that somehow encoded in this structure is this printer and the, the, the tape, you know, what to actually say, right? So these are really kind of extraordinary. Um, jump over to these, these oscillators. So here's some that go in different patterns, right? And so let's see, these have cycle four. So they'll go, do, 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 you know, they'll go in a four cycle. These say again. Oh yeah, thank you, sorry. Yeah. So these things will do four steps before it repeats itself, like a little engine. These will do five, these will do six. So I, I love this because it's sort of like in between math and biology, right? It's very clearly like sort of discrete math and all this, but it has a very sort of, you know, pond water under a microscope type, type look to it. I have not by all means gone through any of all of these. They, they add new ones every couple months or so. Your, your, your job is going to be to find some cool ones I haven't seen before and, and show them to me. So here's something that makes these things and then something else that eats them. Let's see the billiard table. Okay, we looked at that one. Okay, there's a really wild one here. Um, 
Oh, you want to see the ants? These are a different kind of ants, these Langston's ants. I just saw it a little bit ago. Do you see it? Yeah, let me show you. Um, oh, termites is one of them, too. Encounter. Some of these are really wacky. Oh, I want the one that, um, the von Neumann one. Okay, so let's just start with this one here, because this is kind of like the coolest one. Yeah, we're going to get to that one. We're probably going to get to that one next time, because we're running out of time. Um, this one is super fun. This one is just kind of like artsy. Go under super, and it's art on a Taurus super life. And this one has more categories. So if we add more states, we can get some really wacky stuff happening. And it's almost hard to see everything that's happening at once on here. But you've got like certain things that are like gobbling up other things and there's sort of all these different rules. And so if we look here, um, there's a way to show the patterns. There we go. So here's all the different states this one can go through. So what I'd like you to do, you know, tonight is to go through, oh, there's Lance and Nancy. To go through tonight and, and run some of these and take, out, take a look at what all of these things do and just kind of have fun, right? Because these things are really off the map. If you find someone that says they fully understand cellular automata, you can safely call them a liar because these things are not well understood. Um, let's see. The acorn is a particularly interesting one. What happens when you plant an acorn? You get a lot of stuff. Well, can I ask a real quick question? Just, yeah, please. I mean, in, in general, is there sort of a principled approach? You know, somebody who created that that carnival one, which, which was all that activity. I mean, did they just have to trial and error all the way until it's, it just created something that they wanted? Or, or do, you I know, think it's is, both. is there sort of a science around this or at least, a, you know, a guide guidelines? I think it's around. a little bit of both. Um, I found this... Um, was it this lexicon? Yeah. yeah. So here is, this is really wild. People have gone through and really kind of like mapped out. I was really shocked at how many of these things had, had been mapped out, right? Um, and so they have these wacky names, right? Garden of Eden, you know, Gemini Puffer, uh, Ghost Herschel. So people have been like kind of figuring out, this one goes back to 96 and stuff, you know, what and how to make all these things. I think now, like you're saying, you can make stuff. I think we're now getting to the point where we can think, all right, what if I needed a counter that does this or that and the other? So what we're gonna what we're gonna look at next time when we're gonna code up is my, my favorite one is this idea of, of wire world. And this allows us to simulate. So here we're gonna simulate a clock. So this is like the oscillator. So if we slow this down, uh, I think this is very good model for spiking neurons as well. And so we can look at that. But what this is gonna allow us to do, and we're gonna program this from scratch. This is one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. And this is a, a version of this called wire world, and we're gonna, we're gonna do this from scratch. And if I run this wire world, this is a circuit written out of this graphics that runs this game of life like operation. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna print out the prime numbers. And so I can, I can speed this up. What's really nice about Golly, unfortunately our Python version will never run this fast. The Golly has some really nice kind of pre-compiled, it looks for loops and patterns and stuff. So it can actually run this thing uh, pretty fast. I'll speed it up there. And so you can see this thing is now cranking out uh, the prime numbers. So this is really at the heart of you know, how wacky this complex system stuff is, is we're going to use systems to simulate other systems that simulate other systems and, and make ourselves dizzy in terms of um, this simulation. So I'll just, I want to show one um, real quick, and then we'll, we'll rub out of the time. This one might be in Golly, but I'm not sure. Um, So computers can simulate things. And one of the most extraordinary things they can simulate is themselves. And the, here's an example of sort of the universality of these cellular neural networks is they can simulate other things. And this is kind of wacky. Let me speed this up a bit. So here we, we see uh, the game of life, simple rules operating on this very particular pattern. And what's going to emerge is sort of this other macroscopic machine, which is simulating something in itself. The only thing that's happening is that same game of life square. That's the only thing. And what we're happening is we're simulating game of life. 
on a whole nother scale, right? So if this doesn't make you dizzy, think about it a little bit longer because this is really kind of wacky. And now you can imagine you could do it again and again and again and so on. Uh, but what we've done is we've, we've built a cellular automata machine out of cellular automata, right? So somehow all of this contraption and these little, little, little bits of stuff here are acting out the rules of game of life itself, which is really kind of, uh, kind of wacky and, and, kind of, and kind of meta. So go download this Golly program tonight. Go through this. Uh, they're super fun. There's some really interesting kind of models. Some of these um, you probably played at some point on the internet as a kid with something like this, which is sort of a fun sand type game, a digital sand, and it'll sort of simulate you know, piles and avalanches and all that. And so we get all of this really amazing physics about critical angles and phase transitions and avalanches and, and all that kind of good power law kind of stuff. And so this is a slightly different... This cellular time is really interesting. This one, you have to use a different set of rules depending on if it's an even time step or an odd time step. And when you do that, you get these sort of uh, conservation properties, more like physics. And so this hints at an area called digital physics. It's not quite clear yet if the world we live in is made out of graph paper. If we zoom in all the way at the bottom, we know we run into atoms. Atoms means you can't cut. That's what the word means. And so, you know, are there truly atoms below the atoms that we don't quite know about? So we're about out of time for today. Go through and have fun with these. They're super I'm gonna ask cool. you go over like uh, assignment one and maybe the due dates or anything. Yeah, I haven't put any firm due dates on anything yet. Just I wanted to get everybody to get caught up. I'll post some. I'll post that so you can have some um, some expectations. You have plenty of time for now. So for now, just go through and, and, and document the first two notebooks that we've gone through in class, the random walks and the percolation, and start documenting those um, with all of your notes so you can explain it yourself. Remember, we had said you're, you're trying to think of two people you want to explain it to, yourself a year ago that you wanted to give a head start to, and yourself a year from now who might find, find that you need these tools for some other project and you, you don't want to have to learn it all from scratch. Uh, but I'll put that on there so you, don't have, you, have, you have plenty of time so far. Okay, so we're keeping up with the readings. We're fine. And yeah. We're just... yeah, so for, for now, make sure that you can keep up with these notebooks. Any notebook we've done in class so far, rerun it at home. Um, you know, add more blocks, kind of like we did. Take a block, break it up into pieces. Look at the output in between. Actually, print out the variables. To me, that's the best way to learn this. Okay, thank you. This is a really fun one. I've started to code this one from scratch in Python. I, we'll, we'll look at this one next last next time too. This is called a diffusion limited aggregate, and so this kind of looks like a neuron. It kind of looks like lightning. Kind of looks like uh, dendrites in, in 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 root structure or something like that. And so these cellular models are, are really, really all over the place. So have fun uh, looking over these and uh, be prepared next time to present one on the chat that's fun and you can show it to the rest of the group. All right, thank you everybody for your time today and your attention. Uh, Elon's gonna continue with the next session if you wanna encourage everybody to stick around for that part. Uh, for I'm just, uh, just, just on uh, bookkeeping, I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna stop this recording and then uh, I can send you all the link um, or I'll just send it to well, I can just send it to you so that uh, and I have it from uh, previous classes as well. But it's just it's probably easier if we split them. Uh, so, Definitely. Okay, okay, perfect. All right. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, please send them send them by email.